Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have seen that partial equilibrium analysis concerns consumers and producers. We have seen that consumers equilibrium is essentially the equilibrium between the utilities gained from consumption and the price paid for the act of consumption. Producers equilibrium is the equilibrium between the revenues gained from production and the costs incurred during production. By the time of Marshall and certainly by the time of Marshall's successor in Cambridge, Pigo, this economics also had got extended itself into efficiency arguments for the government. One of the important canons of taxation at the time of Pigo and afterwards was the canon of efficiency. How much should the tax be depended upon the revenue from the tax and the costs not only of collecting the tax, but the costs incurred by the people through incidence of tax. So, here again in taxation and public economics in public finance, you had the notion of efficiency translated to the role of the government. The implication was that the government must tax only in such a manner that its taxation activity is efficient. Further, a more general rule for the government in the canons of public finance were the rules relating to expenditure of the government and the tax earnings of the government. It was considered that a government was efficient as long as it did not overspend its tax revenues. In other words, the tax collection by a government should be the limit for the expenditure by the government as far as possible. It is like living within your means. So, if the government could live within its means, then it was considered an efficient government. So, the idea which is very common today, which is prevalent in all canons of evaluation of government activities in modern economies, the idea of a balanced budget goes back to this idea of efficiency of the government living within its means. So, we have partial equilibrium analysis extending itself from the consumer to the producer and eventually also to the government. So, you had rules of efficient consumption, you had rules of efficient production and more importantly rules of efficient governance. So, markets as long as these rules of efficiency were followed would not fail. In other words, there would be no disequilibria in the market, which would lead to a little excess here or a little deficiency there, which would mean wastage. So, markets would not fail as long as these rules of equilibrium are followed. But when would markets fail? There were three broad conditions for the failure of markets, which basically means that market is generating excess demand or excess supply, which basically means that a little bit more is produced and than is wanted in the system or a little bit less is produced than is wanted in the system. Either way, an excess demand or an excess supply in the market constitutes the failure of the market. 
So, a short run excess demand or excess supply is considered a failure of the market. Why do these things happen? In general, short run fluctuations are considered to be essentially a function of demand, because supply of most of the goods is given in the market. The ability of supply to rise or fall in the market is a time consuming factor and therefore, the ability is limited in the short run. Most supplies are given at an immediate point of time. They are slightly flexible from a short run point of time and they are really flexible only in the long run point of time. So, therefore, supply is a limitation, but in the short run nobody can prevent demand from rising or falling due to maybe a change in fashion or due to a number of factors affecting the tastes and habits of consumption in the economy. So, we have possibilities of fluctuations in demand in different markets, which give rise to disequilibria in different markets, which in turn would lead to excess supply or excess demand in different markets. In short, different markets may fail in the short run due to essentially demand induced factors. Now, we shall see shortly that the government might have something to do with these fluctuations, but at this point in time let us look at the second factor which is important in leading to market failures. These are the existence of monopolies and monopolistic competition. We already know that monopoly is a single supplier or a single manufacturer of particular products. This means that the entire market is controlled, regulated by a single supplier and a single producer in the market. Therefore, there are inefficiencies connected with the absence of competition. In the case of monopoly, the rules of equilibrium are somewhat different. Efficient equilibrium occurs under different conditions for a monopolist than for a competitive producer. For a competitive producer, he has to constantly ensure that he is supplying goods in the market within the limitations of his cost of production. He has to get enough revenues to meet the cost of production. And if he is efficient, he is also pushed towards reducing his cost of production continuously. So, therefore, a ceiling on the cost of production is an attempt by most of the competitive producers, so that their revenue cost difference is maximized or their profit is maximized. In the case of a monopolist, there is very little change that happens in the revenue behavior in the market, because the whole revenue, the, whole, the entire demand curve facing the producer in the market is a demand curve facing a single producer in the case of a monopolist. So, that demand curve constitutes the revenue curve for the monopolistic producer. You do not need to disaggregate that demand into a demand facing a number of producers, no, it is just one demand curve and it is facing this monopolist. This means that the monopolist is under no particular duress to minimize cost of production and this is what happens. So, the short run equilibrium condition for a monopolist is pretty much the same as a long run equilibrium condition. In the short run, the marginal cost equals marginal revenue in both the competitive market and in the monopolistic situation, fine. But in the long run, competition ensures that the average cost of production stays below the average revenue in the industry at least stays equivalent to the average revenue, but not but does not increase above the average revenue. In other words, the average revenue, average cost equality condition is a very necessary long run condition of efficiency in a competitive market. But in monopoly, there is no such compulsion. 
the short term condition of marginal cost equaling marginal revenue can continue forever. Because as I said, the demand curve facing a monopolist is a demand is the one single demand curve in the industry. So, under monopoly, the lowest average cost curves could be attained at some particular output x, but a monopolist might stay well below this production level and might be incurring what are losses from a competitive point of view, but not loss at all from a monopoly point of view. He is making good in the short run, but the short run condition applies in the long run. What happens in monopoly then is that there is an excess capacity. How does this happen? His average cost gets minimized in the long run at a particular output x, let us say, but he never gets to this minimum average cost because minimizing average cost is not a consideration at all for a monopolist. So, he stops way ahead, way below that level of production and stops with the marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So, he produces at some level y which is way below x. So, the difference x minus y, the two levels of production is what is called excess capacity. What production can happen under the lowest cost and what production is actually happening now. That difference in output is what is called excess capacity. Now, what is important to note is that under monopoly, there is always excess capacity. There is always that bit of output which remains unproduced because the monopolist is not going on to the lowest cost possible. Now, excess capacity in one producer is wastage of resources. I have capacity installed to manufacture 500 pieces of soap a day, but if I am utilizing much less than that because my demand facing me is only 300 units, then I have an excess capacity for 200 units. Now, if all soap producers are setting up capacity for 500 units and producing only 200, 300 units, then it means there is excess capacity in the system as a whole for soap production, which is a waste of resources. So, under monopoly, markets fail. Markets fail because resources are not utilized efficiently. This market failure is different from the market failure of excess demand or excess supply as we have seen earlier. This is a long run wastage. Excess capacity under monopolies is a long run thing. Short run, long run do not make a difference as long as the monopoly is concerned. So, you have short run excess demand, excess supply leading to market failures which are temporary, short run. But in monopolies, the market failure is a long run market failure in the sense of loss of efficiency in the system as a whole. Similar is a condition with any competition which is monopolistic. What we mean when we say the competition is monopolistic is that the competition is not free. There are not large number of producers who are competing with each other, not, not large number of suppliers competing with each other. So, that there is a tendency in them to push down revenues and therefore, push down costs and reach efficiency. Here, instead of a monopoly, there might be 5, 6 suppliers who take care of the whole demand in the market. There is competition among these 5, 6 people, but it is monopolistic in the sense that together they could have rules which they could have among themselves to make sure that they do not compete each other out of business. So, monopolistic competition also has a condition where marginal cost equals marginal efficiency as a short run equilibrium condition, but in the long run you need not have average cost, average cost equaling average revenue. In other words, excess capacity is as much a part of monopolistic competition as it is a part of monopoly. So, that in general whenever you are missing out on a perfect competition or a competition in which there are a large number of producers, large number of sellers, so that no individual producer or seller can affect the price in the market. Now, if you do not have that condition of such large numbers, 
when the competition is not perfect anymore, then you have inefficiencies, market failure. So, all forms of organization of the market other than a perfectly competitively organized market are inefficient and therefore, market failures according to partial equilibrium analysis. So, we have two reasons why markets can fail. One reason why market can fail is short run fluctuations in demand which lead to excess demand or excess supply in markets which lead to market failure. The other is the existence of monopoly or monopolistic competitions. The first one are temporary or short run fluctuations, but the second ones are long run causes of inefficiency or market failures. Now, in recent times, another major factor which is considered as a contributant towards market failures is the behavior of the government. In recent times, the breaking of the old rule of efficient governance, which is a government which spends within its tax earnings, it sticks to its budget. Now, when this does not happen, when the governments are profligate, when they are spending more than they are earning, when the government expenditure crosses the government's tax collection, when the government's budget or deficit, this is considered as a government induced market failure. What happens here is, where the government collects taxes, it takes a certain amount of money away, purchasing power away from the economy. When the government spends money, it releases purchasing power or money into the economy. When tax revenue is lower than the government expenditure, it what it means is that the government is taking less money away from the economy than it is putting back into the economy. In other words, in other words, the economy is becoming money rich, purchasing power rich whenever the government has a deficit budget. Now, a deficit budget then adds to the money supply in the economy, purchasing power in the economy and when there is more money in the hands of people, they spend it and when they spend it, prices go up. When prices go up, it is called an inflation. Whenever there is an inflation, the economy loses efficiency. Likewise, when the government is very tight and very stringent in its behavior, when it is collecting lots of taxes, but is not spending much money, the government is drawing money away from the economy. The total expenditure of the government is less than the money it takes away from the economy. In other words, the behavior, behavior of the government is making the economy poorer and poorer, less and less cash rich. In short, the economy tends to move on a downward spiral at a deflationary kind of activity or a recession, a contraction. So, government's behavior either profligate or stringent might lead to an expansion or contraction in the economy, in short an instability in the economy. These are market failures, which are not failures because market forms are either monopolistic or monopolist. monopolist or because there are short run fluctuations in demand, but because the government's behavior is either profligate or too stringent. In other words, the government is creating induced, sorry, government is creating fluctuations, inducing fluctuations in the economy due to its budgetary behavior. So, the third major reason underlying economic fluctuation in the economy leading to inefficiency is the government's behavior. More often than not, a stringent government is not something that we find happening. What we find is a profligate government which spends more. In modern times, there are a number of reasons why the government spend more money than they should. And when the government does that, at the end of each round of spending, the government leaves the economy so much cash richer and so much more purchasing power that there is an inflationary pressure in the economy. Profligacy of government is attributed to be one of the major drawbacks of developing economies today. Almost every activity of World Bank when it is funding or supporting projects in developing economies, it is looking at how the government is behaving. 
the World Bank advises the government to behave in a non profligate fashion. The government is advised by the World Bank to restrict its expenditure so that all the projects in the economy could work under a non inflationary condition. Therefore, the projects could yield their results more efficiently. In short, profligacy of government is a constantly feared aspect of modern economies, both developed and non underdeveloped. I am talking of underdeveloped just now, but the fact is that one of the major crises in world economy today is because of the crisis in the United States. I do not have to go into too many details, but the crisis which United States is facing today can be traced back to the days in the 1960s when the government in the US started spending much, much more money than it was earning. There were continuous succession of deficit budgets which led to a series of economic crises, stagflations and so forth. Even today, one of the problems facing the US economy is that the government is not able to restrict itself very much. Anyway, that is not that is United States, that is not India, that is not developed economy, developing economies. What we have to look at now is the fact that there are three reasons for market failure. One reason for market failure is short run excess demand or supply in the market, mostly excess demand. The second reason for market failure is a long run reason involving monopolistic or monop monopolistic competitive conditions. And the third is a profligate government which spends lots and lots of money. We, can, we have now finished dealing with partial equilibrium analysis. So, let us look at the Walrusian type of analysis which is general equilibrium. We shall look at the general equilibrium analysis illustratively. When we studied Walrus, we saw for instance that you could think in terms of a large number of commodity markets, a large number of factory markets, all of them being in equilibrium simultaneously in a process of resolution of the market. But we shall use the general equilibrium analysis now in a much more limited fashion. We shall talk of basically three markets. We shall talk in terms of the market for labor, we shall talk of the market for commodities or goods, and then we shall talk of the market for money. And we shall see how the whole thing hangs together and that inefficiency in one of these will translate itself to inefficiency in the other and so on and so forth. So, let us look at the three markets, the labor market, the goods market and the money market. And their simultaneous resolution leads to equilibrium wages, equilibrium levels of employment, equilibrium levels of production in the economy and therefore, goods market equilibrium and finally, equilibrium prices, nominal prices in the economy where the money supply, money demand are also equal. Let us look at the labor market first. Demand for and supply of labor can be assumed in the st standard neoclassical format to be a function of real wages. We know that real wages is the wages in terms of the number of goods and services which money wages can buy. In other words, if money wages is capital W and if prices are capital P, then small w real wages, then we have small w equals capital W upon capital P. Well, the demand for labor is a decreasing function of real wages, which simply means that as real wages go on in declining, the employers would like to employ more and more laborers for simply the reason that they will be able to get more out of the workers than what they have to pay. In other words, we are thinking in terms of an inverse relationship between real wages and, and demand for labor as in the equation in the PowerPoint. Supply of labor can be thought of as an increasing function of real wage given the disutility of work. Laborers are said to compare the disutility of work with the reward for work. The more they have to work, the greater the drudgery or the disutility of work and therefore, the less satisfied they will be with work. So, in order to induce them to produce more work, in order to induce them to contribute more to the productive process, they should be induced with higher rewards or in short, higher real wages induces laborers to work more. Supply of labor is positively correlated with real wages as you can see 
in the PowerPoint presentation. In equilibrium, of course, the demand for labor will equal the supply of labor at some level, which we call N E, which is the equilibrium number of workers employed. And this is the equilibrium quantity of labor employed in the economy at some equilibrium real wage W by P E, which is the equilibrium real wage. In the goods market, aggregate demand is a function of price. Generally, like all demand functions, the higher the price, the lower the demand. In other words, the relationship between demand and price, aggregate demand and price is inverse as you can see in the PowerPoint presentation. Aggregate supply in turn in the general equilibrium and neoclassical versions of the issue, aggregate supply is given in the short term. This is because although output is a function of capital, labor and technology, in the short term the quantum of capital cannot be changed and technology is even more rigid in the short term. Therefore, in the short term aggregate supply is a function of the total labor force employed in production, which is N. And at a given point in time, total labor force employed in the economy is in dependent upon the labor market equilibrium and therefore, it is N E and therefore, goods market equilibrium would mean aggregate demand and aggregate supply will be equal to some output aggregate output Y E, which is the output produced by N E the equilibrium number of workers employed. And <coughs> this aggregate demand and aggregate supply would resolve at an equilibrium price P E, which is equilibrium nominal prices. So, we have well they can be real or nominal prices as we shall see when we are talking about the money market next. But at this point of time, these prices can be real prices or nominal prices, but they are equilibrium prices at which aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. So, we have a commodity market which clears with aggregate demand equaling aggregate supply at an aggregate output Y E and with an average price level P E, which coincides with an equilibrium in the labor market, where labor in equilibrium is N E employed at equilibrium wage rates small w E or W by P E. Let us now look at the money market. The money market in turn consists of the demand for money and supply of money. Demand for money when it can be looked upon as the demand for cash balances with which people would like to buy things. It is the demand for meeting all the transactions that you have on a day to day basis plus maybe a little insurance you think the price might go up or you might think that there is a contingency coming up whatever there is a little precaution which you want to take which you want to have some money for. So, if the total money you need is 50 rupees during the week, you might like to put a little 10 rupees extra as a kind of a little insurance, a little cushion. So, your total demand for money might be 60 rupees a week. More generally, we can think in terms of a certain fraction of the nominal national income, some k fraction as the total demand for money. Now, this fraction usually does not change very much. This fraction is usually determined by the institutions in the, in the money market, in the monetary sector, in the economy. So, this version which is called the Cambridge version involves the demand for money as a particular fraction of the nominal national income of the country. The other version of this which is a variation is known as the Fisherian version attributable to Irving Fisher the American economist, where the total 
national income, nominal national income, which is the price times the total real output in the economy, P times Y, is considered equal to the total stock of money in the economy M doing the rounds while transacting business in the economy. For instance, if there are 10 rupees in the economy and each rupee does 3 rounds each day, then actually the total value of money supply is 30 rupees. So, M is 10 and V is 3 and therefore, the total money supply in the economy is 30. According to Irving Fisher, the total demand for money which is the demand for all the goods and services in the economy, which is the price times the value of the number of goods and services P y equals the supply of money in the economy, which is M v. Now, the difference between the Fisherian equation and the Cambridge equation is that the Cambridge equation talks in terms of a certain fraction of the nominal national income, some k fraction, which is demanded as the cash balance with which people need to purchase goods or take a little precaution. However, in the Fisherian version, it is not the cash balance which seems to be important, but the stock of money which is doing the rounds. But in reality, there is not much difference if you look at what velocity does in the economy. What velocity does in the economy is to locate money in different hands at different points of time. So, if the money is doing 3 rounds in a day, then the velocity is 3 and if there are 10 rupees in the economy, then what you are saying is this 10 rupees is doing 3 rounds and the total money supply is 30 rupees. So, what is the fraction of money actually in the economy? It is 10 divided by 30, one third. One third is the stock of money in the economy. In short, the Cambridge K is nothing but the reciprocal of velocity k equals 1 by v. That is the relationship between the Cambridge and Fisherian versions of the money market equilibrium. Now, in the long run, we do not know what happens to have to the value of v. In other words, what happens to the speed with which money circulates in the economy. But certainly, we know that in the short run, there are a number of institutions in the economy, in the money market in the asset market, in the capital market, etcetera, which keeps the rate of circulation of money constant. In other words, we can believe that velocity is constant in the short run. What this means then is that on the money supply side, changes in money supply will not be happening due to change in velocity. It will be happening only if the stock of money rises or falls. And who is responsible for the stock of money in the economy? The government. The government is the one which prints money and releases it into the economy. So, the major source of disequilibrium in money, in money market is not the money demand or money supply, but it is the government whose behavior in relation to money supply becomes very crucial. So, the value of M, the stock of money is very critical in ensuring whether money market is in equilibrium or not. And if the government is very profligate, if it is spending a lot of money and is printing a lot of money to spend that money, then it only means that the government is arbitrarily increasing the stock of money in the economy. And given that the production of goods is constant, this is going to push up the prices. So, the basic source of instability in the money market according to Neoclassical theory, according to pre Keynesian theory, is that the government tends to misbehave. The government does not know how to behave wisely. Now, money supply then is exogenous to the money market. In other words, if money demand is some 100 rupees, how much money is supplied is not according to money demand, but is according to what the government wants to print and supply. So, money demand might be 100 rupees, but the government's money supply might be 100, 200, 300, might go on changing. If that happens, then there is instability in the economy and the government's policy is a source of instability. Now, if that happens, the level of prices in the economy become a direct function of the money supplied by the government. So, that the higher the quantity of money supplied, as you see in the PowerPoint, 
the higher the quantity of money supplied by the government, the higher the prices in the economy. So, the government is a source of potential instability in the economy. So, the basic rule which is constantly advocated is that the government should be less profligate, it should be disciplined, it should restrain itself and keep money supply to the lowest, so that prices are kept at some equilibrium level P e. Now, at the same time, one of the central aspects of neoclassical theory is this. One of the central aspects of general equilibrium theory also is this, that it is believed that changes in money supply might change the nominal price of goods, but not the real prices of goods. What is discussed here is that increase money supply might make rice costlier for instance. You might have to pay 10 rupees more for a kilo of rice just because there is lot more money in the economy and people are spending it. So, the money price of rice might go up, but how much 1 kilo of rice can fetch as an exchange with some other commodity that might not change. For example, if the price of rice goes up by 20 percent and the price of chilies go up by the same 20 percent, then the quantum of chilies that will exchange for rice remains the same. For example, if rice was costing 10 rupees and chilies cost 2 rupees, then you can say 5 kilos of chilies is equal to 1 kilo of rice. Now, if the price of rice and chilies both rise by 20 percent, they will still exchange for 1 is to 5. Now, what is important in this type of economics is that they say it is only these relative prices or the barter prices of goods from one to another, which are important in determining the equilibrium or disequilibrium in the economy. Changes in money prices, money prices will simply push up prices or changes in money supply will simply put up push up nominal prices or push down nominal prices. They would not really affect the fundamental quality of the economy. In short, according to this type of economics, changes that happen in the money market disequilibrium do not affect the rest of the economy. In short, there is a fundamental belief in this economics that money is neutral. Money is neutral in the sense that it is not going to affect the economy. You supply a lot more of onions in the economy that will affect the economy, because onions are create going to create a difference in the rate of exchange between onions and everything else. But if you have more rupees in the economy, that will just hike up money prices of everything and nothing else. In other words, money is neutral and the economy is divided into two sets, a set of values determined by supply of money in the money market, a set of values determined by rate of exchange barter. So, that at barter level, 1 kilo of rice might continue to exchange for 5 kilos of rice purely in terms of relative prices, but in terms of real price, in terms of nominal prices, the prices of rice and chilies might be anything and they might move around, but it does not affect the economy in a fundamental sense. So, one of the crucial aspects of pre Keynesian economics is the splitting of economics into two parts, the splitting of economies into two parts. Economy is looked upon as consisting of one a real part, which is consisting of all the chilies, all the cabbages, all the rice, all the wheat, all the soup, all the machines and the nominal part, which is just the value of all the rice, the value of all the soap, the value money value of all these things, the monetary part. So, the monetary part of the economy and the real part of the economy are assumed to be completely insulated in this theory. They are disconnected in a in two watertight compartments, as a result of which the economy seems to function very efficiently, whatever happening in the money market. In other words, money is neutral simply means that the economy is dichotomized. The economy is split into at least hypothetically into a real sector and into a monetary sector. Now, this is a very crucial aspect of this kind of economics. It is very crucial simply because Keynes was to argue that this dichotomy, dichotomy does not exist. Changes in money supply were very crucial in actually bringing about stability in the economy. In short, the pre Keynesian economics looked upon 
changes in the money market as being absolutely worthless from the point of view of genuine equilibrium in the economy. Whereas, as we shall see shortly, the economics of Keynes ensured that money is very central and very crucial in the economy. From the point of view of what we have studied all these weeks, it is possible to recall one thing when we are talking about Keynes and pre Keynes in economics. We may go back to look at the mercantilists and recall the fact that when mercantilists were writing and discussing, they thought money supply was very crucial. They thought, they thought that money supply will cause the levels of the economy to prosper or to decline. And to them therefore, bullionism or the quantum of gold that came into the country and which influenced the money supply in the economy was very crucial. And we know that from the time of home onwards, from Adam Smith onwards and so forth, this became an object of ridicule. And people were saying for generations, for more than 100 years, that the mercantilists were some kind of fools to believe that change in money supply would actually affect the economy, would actually affect the levels of employment, will actually affect the levels of aggregate demand, production of goods and so forth. So, this belief goes on right up to the time of Keynes. And when Keynes comes up, we suddenly realize that some, many, some of these mercantilist beliefs are coming alive. We shall see when we are talking about Keynes subsequently that money becomes very central. Not necessarily gold, but money becomes very central. So, the old mercantilist belief in the power of money to change the economy is restored by Keynes. In fact, Keynes has a lot of friendly things to say about mercantilists as opposed to his neoclassical predecessors. But talking about Keynes and money, mercantilists and money, that is neither here nor there. At this point in time, what we have to realize is that pre Keynes in economics assumed that money was neutral that the economy was dichotomized into a money market and a real market and that these two sides did not interact at all. Now, let us go and do a little bit of thinking on the implications of this general equilibrium. We have seen that equilibrium in labor market leads to equilibrium level of employment and equilibrium real wages. Equilibrium of em level of employment in the labor market leads to an equilibrium level of goods production in the economy with equilibrium level of labor determining production of equilibrium level of outputs in the economy at some equilibrium price in the economy. And then we have also seen that this equilibrium persists as long as money is neutral. In other words, as long as the economy can be dichotomized theoretically as long as we can assume that money market and real market are not interconnected in any way. This in brief is the story of pre Keynesian economics. There are two issues which tended to create problems for this kind of economics. One was that right from the end of 19th century, you no, know, in fact from the third quarter of the 19th century from the, from the 1870s onwards it was found that not only in England, but in United States and also in the rest of Europe, wages and prices did not behave as per demand supply pressures in the market. In other words, one of the central reasons why this economy pre Keynesian economy work, 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 would work efficiently is that if prices and wages were flexible. Suppose there is an excess demand in the labor market due to some reason. For example, suppose the producers suddenly discover that there is a lot of demand for the product abroad. So, they demand more labor in the market. When the demand for labor suddenly increases, it pushes up the real wages. And when more labor is more, when more wages are offered, then more laborers are willing to work, supply of labor increases. So, there is a new equilibrium in the labor market with higher wages. Now, in the same way, the higher level of employment shifts the supply curve for goods and services such that now higher level of 
production is possible in the economy at a different equilibrium price. Now, as long as prices and wages can therefore fluctuate, the economy can make keep making adjustments. Suppose for some reason wages and prices do not fluctuate, there are serious problems. So, the fundamental adjustment factor in this neoclassical or pre Keynesian economics is the fact or the assumption that wages and prices are fluid and they can be the sources of adjustment in the economy. Any shock or external pressure in the economy causes wages or prices to move and they induce a process of adaptation and adjustment in the economy, which eventually pushes the economy from one level of equilibrium to another level of equilibrium. So, what is called the wage price flexibility is a central aspect of adjustment and perpetual equilibrium in the neoclassical or pre Keynesian market. Now, one of the things that was discovered in Europe and in America in the 18th century was that wages and prices were not flexible at all. Wages and prices were more and more and more rigid in European economies and in America and in Britain in the last quarter of the 19th century, which basically meant that whatever the pressure, whatever the external pressure in the economy, the ability of the adjustment uh, ability of economies to adjust is considerably constrained by the fact that wages and prices do not move. So, the rigidity of wages and prices constituted, constituted a major issue which the economists had to think about constantly. This was one of the factors that brought up Keynesian economics. The other issue that brought up Keynesian economics was a thing called gold standard. We shall have to talk about it in the next class because gold standard is a very central aspect of the Euro European monetary system till the 1920s. In the 1920s, there is a serious crisis of this gold standard, which leads to a collapse of the gold standard, which means basically the monetary system in Europe collapses. The rates of exchange across European currency change dramatically, especially pound with reference to French franc and so on and so forth and the US dollar till such that, that by the 1930s, the monetary system of the world has collapsed and there is a constant search and a new search for a new monetary system in the world. But the fact of the matter is this, that the fall of gold standard has something very big to do with the rise of Keynesian economics, because there was a particular solution which was adopted when gold standard failed in Britain which solution was consistently opposed by Keynes. And Keynes said this would be counterproductive. And as things happened, eventually this is what happened. The solutions adopted by the British government in the gold standard crisis led to the worsening of the crisis as Keynes had predicted. This was one of the factors that came that was responsible for the rise of Keynesian economics. And equally, from 1930s onwards when the great depression happened, when employment levels dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, nobody knew what to do except Keynes who suggested a set of policies which alone were the ones to enable economies to recover. So, there were two issues which were actual economic crises in Europe. One was the failure of gold standards and another was uh, the growth of unemployment in Europe, both of which were factors which were responsible for the rise of new thinking in economics, new ways of looking at economics and this was Keynesian economics. We shall see in the next class that Keynesian economics was based on entirely different foundations than pre Keynesian economics, that the premises were totally different including the faith on the free market. Keynes believed that the free market was not capable of delivering the goods. He believed that the free market was congenitally, congenitally prone to disorder, congenitally prone to, prone to sickness and it was the government which had to be the continuous nursemaid which had to nurse the economy. We shall see all this in the next class. For the time being, we have come to the end of our discussion of economics before the advent of Keynes. To sum up, this was an economics which based itself on the assumption of the worthiness of market economy, of laissez-faire and of minimal governmental interference. And this 
was based on partial equilibrium analysis and general equilibrium analysis to show how economies, market economies continue to be self-sustained in their efficiency. In the next class, we shall go on to discuss Keynes. Thank you.